Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth day of the EFD annual meeting and to our keynote talk for the day. My name is Erin Sills, um, and I'm a professor at North Carolina State University, as well as a co-coordinator of EFD's Network of Women in Environmental Economics for Development, or WINNEED. Today, I have the pleasure of moderating the keynote speaker. Um, I'm sure that her talk will provoke a robust discussion. So let me start by reminding you to please post your questions in the Q&A, and you can do this at any time during the talk. Um, but it would help me to moderate if you can put them in the Q&A rather than the chat. Uh, so please keep that in mind as we go along. So now um, introducing our speaker, Farzana Afridi received her PhD in economics from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. She is now an associate professor in the economics and planning unit of the Indian Statistical Institute in Delhi. She also has affiliations with the International Growth Center's India program and the ESA Institute of Labor Economics. Her research interests lie at the intersection of development and labor economics, and she works on issues such as gender and social identity, human capital, and governance. She's leading multiple projects currently uh, with support from the Gates Foundation. And in these projects, she's analyzing and suggesting measures um, to reduce the constraints or loosen the constraints that women face um, in engaging in economic activities. Um, she's published this work widely and is going to tell about us about some of it today. Uh, so with that introduction and one more reminder to post your questions in the chat, Farzana, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Erin, for the kind introduction and thank you to EFD for having me. And I must congratulate the entire EFT team on organizing this huge conference so seamlessly and effortlessly. Uh, so without further ado, let me share my screen. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> So I'm going to give you just a brief outline of the talk first. So uh, I'll begin with a set of facts related to gender differences in participation in domestic and market work, and also delve into the division of labor. Therefore, as a result of this difference in time allocation, both at home and at work, and in particular, I'll focus on the agricultural sector. Based on these set of facts then, Essentially, I'm going to hypothesize that there is going to be a gendered differential effect of technological shocks or te changes in technology uh, within the home, if there are these changes in home production technology, as well as if and when there are changes in the market production, particularly focusing on farm production. So the second set of slides will then look at the gender impacts of technological shocks to build on this hypothesis and basically try to convince you that there will be these gender differential effects. And for that, I'm going to look at two categories of technological changes. So one would be focusing on productivity enhancing technological change. So in case one, I will look at home production technology and in that specifically looking at shifts towards clean fuels for cooking. And in case two, we look at market production technology, which would be farm mechanization. And both in these cases, what we are interested in looking at, what are the potential gender differential impacts of these technological changes, which can be productivity enhancing. Then I'll move on to look at negative shocks to production technology in the sense of climate change affecting agricultural production. And then again, look at uh, or try to convince you that these impacts of climate change can uh, affect women and men differentially. And finally, I'm going to conclude. Uh, so that's the broad outline of the talk. So first I begin with the set of facts that I wanted to put forth in order to you then hypothesize about uh, the effects of technology on uh, women versus men. So, uh, you know, it is pretty well acknowledged that women's time allocation to domestic work is disproportionately more than it is for men. Uh, 
And this seems to be particularly true in many developing countries, particularly when we look at South Asia, South Asia as well as West Asia. And uh, what is also appreciated now, and there's a lot of work going on, is looking at the gender gap in participation in market work. And so just to you know, highlight some of those figures and the data that we have, so if you look at this data from the OECD, for instance, which shows the female to male ratio of time that is devoted to unpaid care work, then what you see is that essentially women, particularly in India, and India is right on the top, are spending almost 10 times more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, allocating their time to work, uh, which is unpaid within the home. And uh, it is declining as we go to developed countries. So for example, the United States is at the lower end of this uh, distribution, but women in the US also are spending almost twice the amount of time in uh, home production or unpaid care work as opposed to men. Uh, so women's participation at home is definitely much higher than it is for men. And that's the first fact. Um, but it is also the second fact that we are aware of is that it is relatively low, the participation of women is relatively low in market work. So if you look at female labor force participation rates, so this is a portion of population which are aged five and older who are economically active, then what we see is that uh, a broad uh, you know, group of countries, which would be South Asia, East Asia, also in North Africa, where the participation is particularly low, but then if we um, look at the distribution across different countries as well, it's not as high the participation as it is for men. Men typically you'll find almost 100% labor force participation. Whereas if you look at uh, for the world average for women, less than 50% uh, of women are actively involved in market work. So that's our fact too. So we have uh, these two facts. Uh, about the distribution of time within the household and the distribution of time in market work differing for men and for women. And uh, what I want to then uh, emphasize is the fact that this gender differential in the allocation of time can be interpreted then as gender-based division of labor uh, and this is pretty well acknowledged in the home production literature. There is a ton of research which is looking at um, how uh, women's time is spent more at home in terms of cooking and cleaning and childcare, as opposed to the time that men, men devote to uh, home production activities. Uh, but I think what is less appreciated is also or less recognized is the fact that this gender-based division of labor also manifests itself in market production. And this can manifest itself particularly in contexts where men have a comparative advantage in performing certain tasks. So for example, when we look at agriculture specifically, men can have biological advantages as opposed to, you know, women might be specializing in certain activities and I'll dwell on that later as I go along. Um, uh, on certain tasks within agriculture, for example, might see more of women's specialization as opposed to male uh, uh, labor contribution to that particular task. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to focus a lot of my uh, you know, uh, work right now that I'm doing, which will be on India. So if you look at the gender-based division of labor at home, you see a very interesting um, you know, picture. So we look at on the left hand side, this time spent a domestic work in, in hours per week in 2019. This is across the country in India. And the red line is for men. So men are devoting less than on average of about 10 hours per week on home uh, production on domestic work, whereas women are spending almost uh, 70 hours per week. So there is this big gap. And the interesting thing is that when you look on the right hand side on that graph, it flips the red line and the blue lines flip. And now when we look at, so the, 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 on the right hand side, we're looking at time spent at work in, um, in, in, in remunerated work in hours per week in 2019. And what we see then is that men are spending 
uh, a lot more time. So this gap reverses, the gender gap reverses when we look at the market work as opposed to the domestic work. And that is reinforcing the fact one that I had stated earlier. So as I said, there is this lesser known fact that we also, I wanted to emphasize, which is to look at the gender-based division of labor at work. And this can happen or manifest itself in particular industries or occupations. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be looking at the agricultural sector. So if you look at the left-hand side, so if you look at this graph on the left, the blue is signified for, by female and the red are the male. It's looking at the operation by share of contribution of labor. So uh, if you look at tilling, for example, which is land preparation, which requires a lot of physical strength, right? Um, that uh, sees a lot more participation by men. So almost 90 or more than 90% of the share of labor which is engaged in land preparation is becoming from male labor and very little from female labor. And as we go to sowing, weeding and harvesting, the gender gap is declining and women's participation, the contribution of their labor is going up because these are activities which require some amount of precision. So for example, if you think of you know rice transplantation or if you think of um uh, weeding, for example. So these, the gender gap is declining and this becomes much clearer when we look at the right hand side, which is data coming from the ICRI-SAT, which is looking at labor hours in terms of per acre labor hours. And you can see that the this, this reverses the, uh, uh, the gap, the gender gap reverses when we look at uh, weeding and harvesting. So the proportion of the share of labor hours per acre that is coming from women in weeding is almost 90% as opposed to about 14% for men. And for harvesting as well, there is disproportionately more women who are taking part in this operation as opposed to when we're looking at tilling, when again, as I pointed out earlier, uh, uh, you know, an activity that requires physical strength, you have a lot more male participation, right? So, so uh, what is interesting is that there is a large literature that has focused on the effects of technological change on skilled versus unskilled labor. When these two types of labor are imperfect substitutes and technology, and typically when you have these technological changes, they complement the skilled labor. So we, we have a lot of literature in trade and so on, which will, you know, uh, which has focused on how the unskilled labor are losing out when these technological changes happen, which are complementary to the more skilled labor. But um, the changes in production technology at home or shocks in the market uh, can also produce gender differential impacts on labor usage. And that's what I'm hypothesizing on and I'm going to build on uh, due to this gender-based division of labor. So I hope I've been able to convince you that there is a gender-based division of labor within the home. And there will be certain occupations in uh, particular when we're looking at agriculture, when there is this gender-based division of labor. And depending upon the nature of the technological change, you can have differential effects on male labor as opposed to female labor. And so there will be some losers and some winners potentially when we think of technological changes uh, and that can be categorized by gender as well. And uh, the effects of these technological changes or shocks can vary between the home and the market. So it is possible that there is productivity enhancing uh, changes in home production technology, for example. And because there are more women, uh, women disproportionately spend their time on home production, it might be more complementary to their labor and, and that might result in enhancing the welfare of women. But it is possible that productivity enhancing technological change in the market, when we're looking at the farm, for example, might be um, uh, 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 might um, reduce or have a negative impact on women's labor usage. And so that's what I'm going to go forward and do uh, and, and present to you these cases to try to convince you about the gender differential impacts of these changes. So, so that's the second part of the um, of, uh, of the talk, which I'm essentially going to spend more time on. So first, I wanted to talk about productivity enhancing technological change. 
And uh, the, the first case that I'm looking at here is the home production technology. So again, I would want you to recall, you know, the facts that we have discussed so far and uh, how I'm relating this to looking at the environment is essentially looking at a particular case where, uh, uh, you know, we, we want to shift away from solid fuels. So you have a home production technology, which is uh, potentially enhancing the productivity of women because it could take less time uh, for them to uh, cook uh, when you move from solid fuels to clean fuels, it would also potentially reduce their time on fuel collection. And all of this could lead to an improvement in the welfare of women, given that women spend disproportionately more time on home production activity. So I'm going to present to you some of the preliminary results that we have on a very detailed time use survey that we conducted for women. Uh, who were the primary cooks in uh, 150 villages in the rural areas of central India in 2018-19. And um, in these villages, um, the primary cooks uh, in almost 3,000 randomly sampled households were asked for information on their time allocation in the, uh, during the previous 24 hours. So it's very detailed 24 hour recall of their time spent on a normal, during a normal day. And, um, and, very, uh, and I think what is innovative here is that we've tried to also assess the emotional status during cooking along with you know, gathering detailed information on the types of fuel they're using um, uh, and during the meal, during the cooking process as it is going on and uh, collecting information on what is the uh, fuel usage status of the household. And then we compare the welfare. So I'll define welfare broadly here in terms of women's time spent on leisure, women's time spent on domestic work as well as remunerative work. So one can categorize uh, all of the time allocation data that we have for the previous 24 hours into these broad categories and compare this allocation of time between those households which have uh, access to clean fuel, uh, particularly LPG, and those uh, which don't, and also compare the emotional uh, status during cooking uh, and, or what their experiences were, their psychosocial well-being during the cooking process. So why we call this productivity enhancing technological changes, as you can see on the left-hand side, we have uh, the amount of time that was taken by the woman to prepare the last meal if uh, LPG had been used. Uh, and this is not saying purely LPG has been used. It could have been combined with solid fuels as opposed to this side where we're looking at the uh, uh, preparation along with some solid fuels being used. And you can see that there is a significantly lower time that is required for meal preparation if the household uh, has, uh, uh, if the primary cook had used LPG for cooking. And the same, uh, uh, we can, you can, you know, again, think in terms of whether the household has an LPG connection or doesn't have an LPG connection. And then again, we see a similar difference in terms of time required for cooking. If the household has LPG connection, it is lower as opposed to no LPG connection. So um, then what we do essentially here, as I said, was to compare the amount of time that uh, women took, uh, or the, which is the primary cook, on personal care and domestic work, childcare work, which would be remunerative as well as leisure in minutes in the previous 24 hours. And what we see essentially over here then is that remunerative work uh, is about 26 minutes less they have spent if they uh, belong to a household which has an LPG connection. But also very interesting that uh, the time spent on leisure. So almost there seems to be a one for one substitution here. Uh, there's more time spent on leisure, about 28 minutes as a result of having access to, the, uh, to LPG at the household level. Um, uh, then the second thing is when we're looking at solid fuel collection and making, and we ask them questions about in the typical week in the previous month, 
uh, you know, how many trips were made by the household and out of those trips made by the household or the time spent in collecting firewood or making dung, for example, uh, what proportion was spent by the primary cook. And as you can see in all these cases, again, we see a significantly lower amount of time devoted to collection of firewood um, by the household as a whole, but also specifically by the uh, primary cook. So all, almost all of the gains that you could potentially get from having an LPG connection is going to go to the primary cook. And similarly, uh, when we look at uh, time spent in making dung and in collecting dung by the primary cook. So what I was talking about in terms of emotional well-being was that we also asked the primary cooks to rate the intensity of their feelings. So we gave them a set of feelings which were either negative or positive emotions in random order. And so then we you know, showed them these emojis on a tablet and we said, OK, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to name a particular emotion. And then please recall how you were feeling when you cooked your last meal and you can scale, use these emojis, touch the one that would signify the intensity of that emotion that you were feeling. And, where, and, and, and it was amazing that, you know, how it all lined up in the sense that uh, when we look at all these negative emotions, which is impatience, whether you're frustrated or you're tired, we see that uh, those households where there is an LPG connection uh, are less likely or, or likely to feel these emotions less intensely as opposed to the positive emotions of feeling happy, capable, and content. And uh, this seems to be true across the averages as well. Uh, so, uh, so it's not just the fact that there might be welfare enhancing uh, uh, impacts of having access to a clean fuel because women will be taking in less of the pollution and the smoke that comes from the solid fuel. It also creates this amount of discomfort during the cooking process, which can affect the emotional well-being and has impact therefore on the productivity, besides of course having potentially health improving implications of, uh, uh, as well. Um, so all of this is a story that I'm telling you, and obviously I'm not talking about causality here. Uh, these are just comparisons, mean comparisons that we made, but it is uh, quite obvious that, you know, households which have LPG connection might be very different from households which don't. For one, they would be richer. Uh, they might have different attitudes and so on and so forth. So uh, what we've attempted then is to do a propensity score matching of matching households conditional on, um, uh, you know, a, a host of observable characteristics, uh, household characteristics, as well as the characteristics of the primary cook. And the results still seem to suggest that, yes, there are these very significant benefits and uh, what is interesting is what I wanted to point out over here is that the gain in terms of the lower amount of time that they could devote to domestic work is almost always being translated then into higher time spent on leisure. Um, and the amount of gain of time uh, in terms of time allocation on home production is not that large that they could then uh, 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 use that for being productive in the labor market, but it would be large enough potentially for enhancing their welfare in terms of increasing leisure and the psychosocial well-being, which might have implications for their productivity in general, besides, of course, the health implications, which I haven't discussed over here. Okay, so that's the first case. I want to go to case two now, where we want to look at market production technology. Um, which is farm mechanization. Um, and here, again, so the story so far that we've said is that uh, we've had this productivity enhancing technological shift in the home uh, potentially has positive implications for women's uh, welfare. Uh, and that uh, is, potent, uh, is possibly arising from the fact that uh, women are going to benefit from that technological change disproportionately because of the disproportionate amount of time that they spend on home production. What about market production? So we're going to pick up a case where we're looking at again in agriculture with this farm mechanization and between 90, so 
this particular case, we're looking at between 1999, so over a, um, a you know, uh, a decade or so, the number of tractors which were used in India tripled from two to six million, which has increased the intensity of tra tractor usage on Indian farms significantly. As a result, there were improvements in farm yields, which we validate through our analysis. But this is also a period which saw a decline in the uh, proportion of working age adults who are employed in the rural farm sector, according to the National Sample Survey. And uh, particularly, this was true. For, uh, this has been true for uh, women in India. And uh, you know, one of the uh, highly researched areas in India right now is understanding this uh, puzzle of why women's labor force participation in India has been falling for uh, over two to uh, for over three decades. Let's say. Um, and large part of this decline has happened in the rural sector, in agriculture, without a commensurate increase in the employment in the non-farm sectors in rural India. So here there's a picture that I'm showing you. So on the left-hand side, what you see is the labor usage in agriculture. And you don't see much of a change for men, but for women, there is this big dip. On the right-hand side, we're looking at the usage of implements in labor. Uh, in, in, in agriculture, excuse me. And what you see is that power operated implements increase significantly during the same period. So you know, we're not drawing any uh, you know, uh, uh, causal links as yet, but we are trying to show you that this, these were two uh, 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 trends that we observed during the same period. So how do we try to you know, draw a causal relationship between this um, farm mechanization that we are observing and the labor usage and differential impacts potentially by gender. What we do uh, is to look at um, the quality of the soil at the district level. And basically there's exogenous variation uh, because soil is, uh, quality is given exogenously. Um, uh, in, in the difference between the loamy and clay soil shares in a district. Uh, if, uh, if the soil is more loamy, then it is more amenable to deep tillage as opposed to if it is clay. This is a fact that is pretty well established in the agricultural literature. And therefore uh, having relatively more loamy soil makes that soil uh, um, uh, or makes that area, that district, uh, more likely to adopt mechanization for land tilling. So this is, if you go back you know, to the figures that we had discussed earlier, we saw that it is men who are spending more or disproportionately more labor is being used in land tilling of men as opposed to women. And we use this extent of luminous as an instrument to uh, determine and the, in the first stage, the adoption of tractors or mechanization at the district level. And so what we see here is that, um, you know, our results here suggest that mechanization lead, led to a significant decline in the female labor usage per hectare. Uh, we don't, we see a negative coefficient on male labor use per hectare, but it is not statistically significant. And when we compare these two coefficients between men and women, we find that these two are significantly different from each other. Uh, uh, so that's suggesting that women's labor usage fell significantly uh, relative to the male labor usage. And it seemed to be driven by the decline that we see in weeding task where women's labor fell. Uh, and remember now again, that this is an activity or a task in which uh, disproportionately more labor of women is used. So a one percentage point exogenous increase in mechanization in a, in a task that complements men's labor, decreased female labor usage by 0.7%. Uh, and men's labor also falls, but it was insignificant. And this decline in women's labor is driven by significant fall in labor, which is used for weeding. So this is a downstream operation in which women specialize as opposed to the tilling operation where the technological changes happen, which is complementary to men's labor. We do not find any evidence of women being able to reallocate their labor to the non-farm sector. And um, I'm going to dwell on this later in a little bit, uh, where uh, you know we want to discuss about whether there are potential barriers to women being able to shift to different sectors 
uh, as a result of technological change or structural changes that might be happening in the economy. And what we estimate, therefore, is that farm mechanization can explain up to 22% of the observed decline that we've seen between 1999 and 2011 in India, and it's driven by uh, the agricultural sector. Okay, so we, so, so far what I discussed was looking at gender impacts of technological shocks when they were potentially productivity enhancing uh, technological changes. And uh, we saw one case in which when we're looking at home production technology, when women's welfare potentially improves as a result of that technological change. But in another case, when we're looking at farm work at the market, uh, in the market when you have uh, changes in technology which are complementary to men's labor, there is a, a negative impact on women's share of labor used in, uh, in that particular uh, occupation. And now I'm going to focus on the negative productivity shock. Um, <clears throat> And uh, in particular, I wanted to look at climate change. So I'm, you know, talking, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of broadening this to talk about, uh, to, to say it's climate change, but we are looking at a very specific kind of weather phenomenon here. Um, so, I mean, what, what we are uh, aware of is the fact that climate change has increased the incidence of extreme weather events. So you have, uh, you know, the frequency of droughts or floods have uh, the, the probability that they would happen have risen. And uh, if, if climate change continues unabated, then it is likely that these extreme weather events will become more frequent. And uh, we're also well aware that agriculture is likely to face the brunt of this increasing uncertainty in rainfall because it is very weather dependent, it's rainfall dependent. And this would be particularly true for developing countries like India, where the agricultural systems are rain fed. And also there is extreme poverty. Um, and so we are also, you know, what, uh, focusing more on more vulnerable communities, uh, economically more vulnerable communities. And, in it, uh, and on top of that, we, all, we then want to look, delve a little bit more deeper into looking at whether these uh, potential shocks could have gender differential effects, which I think the literature has not focused on as much as it should. So this is just a graph showing you a five-year moving average of the number of grids which face drought between 1901 and uh, 2002. Sorry, I shouldn't have said if we said this is uh, based on IMD data. Um, and basically, you know, you see this upward sloping line, which is suggesting that uh, the, uh, the, the, the number of these grids facing drought is going up over time. And we get the same uh, figure if we, a look at the proportion of grids uh, facing drought. So uh, basically the incidence of these droughts are going up. Um, and what we do then is, is uh, given that the, um, that the occurrence of a drought is an exogenous phenomenon, it is, you know, it's uh, not determined endogenously. We estimate the impact of droughts on farm labor. We're using very detailed household month level data from agricultural households across eight states uh, from the ICRISAT between 2005 and 2014. And what we, uh, we are, we are uh, our definition of drought essentially here is that if the village, uh, uh, if the rainfall in a particular year in a village lies in the bottom two deciles, looking at the long, relative to the long-term rainfall distribution for that area. And, uh, and it's, it's fascinating to see what uh, you know, decisions or the outcomes in terms of labor inputs uh, uh, are made by the farm households, and that these do seem to have gender differentiated impacts. So the first is when we you know uh, look at the um, the effect of drought on farm labor use per acre. Uh, and so uh, we are just plotting here the coefficient on labor hours for uh, males and females in the household. And what we find is that women's total labor usage falls significantly more than it does for men. And by almost 29 percentage points more 
uh, when the drought occurs in the village. So that's an intriguing finding in itself. Why would it be the case that women's labor would fall more than it would for men? And again, what we find over here is that it goes back to the gender-based division of labor that I pointed out in the facts. Because during a drought, the need for land preparation does not reduce significantly. We're doing the tilling and the land preparation much before you know, the main monsoon season comes. You're preparing the land. Whereas when we look at the downstream activities, which is where women's labor is used more, more, which is in weeding and harvesting, for example, the need for labor in these downstream activities is going to decline because of uh, the fact that there is less rainfall, right? So there is going to be lower demand as a result of the crop yield falling. And, uh, and, 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 and we document that in the paper as well, because when we look at labor usage by task, we see that the, there's a significant decline in the women's labor usage in weeding and in harvesting. And it is driven by this underlying division of labor in agricultural operations. So what is the impact of this change in labor usage? You know, we focused a lot on uh, that in the, uh, I talked about it in the earlier productivity enhancing case, but what implications does it have for earnings, for example, and income inequalities, gender-based income inequalities? So on the left-hand panel here, you look at the effect of drought on migration. So one of the coping mechanisms when you have these climate shocks and typically, you know, not just climate shocks, but any shocks that happen in, in rural areas would be uh, for uh, the rural residents to migrate, to look for work further away from where they are. And uh, what we interestingly find is that women are less likely, 3.4 percentage points, less likely to migrate relative to men. And even if they do migrate, so conditional on migrating, the job search is within a shorter distance of where the current location is. They're not going very far from where they are in order to you know, look for new work. And that's your left-hand panel. Uh, so these are the impact on women versus men. And then you look at the right-hand side. So we've you know, divided this into farm and non-farm work days and earnings for migrants. So those, those conditional on migrating, what we see is that non-farm work days and earnings for women is lower relative to men, even conditional on their getting work. And, and that I think was, it's something that really stands out uh, in terms of uh, understanding uh, what are the avenues available to women and men in order to cope for the, with these shocks that they might face. And consequently, the total earnings of women fall significantly by 52%. It's only about 35 minutes, sorry. Okay. So 52% while men's earnings rise significantly. So you see this disparity in earnings going up as a result of this negative labor shock for women. And I'm not going delving into the details of this because there are you know, differences by hired labor and family labor and so on and so forth. But I think this is what stands out here in terms of you know, um, the finding that we have for the climate shock. So I discussed this bunch of facts and you know, I hypothesized that there would be because of this gender-based division of labor at home and the farm, potential implications of technological changes which differ by gender. We looked at uh, these cases which were productivity enhancing but had very different impacts on, ha have different impacts on women's uh, welfare. The negative shock, uh, again, uh, is more detrimental to women's um, labor and their earnings. And so I'm just bang on and I'm gonna conclude now. So. Uh, women's labor, uh, so women's uh, 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 welfare improves potentially when there's productivity enhancing technological change at home, but technological changes that enhance market productivity in the event that it displaces their labor. So it depends on where the technological change is happening, where in the uh, you know, the distribution of tasks in a particular occupation. And we saw that in this case, um, there was a positive productivity shock, which was complementary to men's labor. The negative productivity shock, which uh, was, was uh, not affecting men's labor, but had impact further downstream. Uh, 
But very interestingly and importantly, the limited market opportunities that women face and the constraints on their mobility, which is reducing the coping me mechanisms which are available to them as opposed to men. So it's, it's, you know, it's fine to say that yes, women have these uh, adverse shocks or bear a disproportionate burden on these adverse shocks. Um, uh, uh, because they might be less, uh, uh, you know, uh, their, their, their skills are less complementary to the technological change, but uh, they also have limited market opportunities and their constraints on their access to those uh, market opportunities. And, um, and these can potentially exacerbate earnings uh, and income inequalities between men and women. So I think there is this uh, very, uh, un, uh, a, a vibrant area of research, which I think is not being looked at or delved into deeply enough to assess how technology or technological shocks can impact men and women differentially. Uh, and, uh, and I think in the post pandemic world, we would expect that mechanization percent potentially is going to speed up. So there are going to be more of these technological changes coming. And it would be worthwhile to think about what are those occupations which are more likely to be adversely affected in terms of displacing labor and whose labor is going to get displaced will depend upon what kinds of occupations get mechanized. And these potentially do have some gender differentiated impacts. So we need to focus on policy, on responding to these uh, uh, inequities that could arise as a result of these shocks. So first we could think in terms of skilling or reskilling of women. Why is it that women, you know, if, if, if even we, when we want to think in terms of structural changes happening in the economy, which shifts from agriculture to manufacturing, women in general, we are seeing a decline in the labor force participation, for example, in India, because they may not have the necessary skills to be able to transition to different kinds of work, but also the restrictions on the mobility. Uh, which are either based on norms or uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, other concerns about safety because of which their mobility is restricted, which reduces the search of, uh, for uh, work um, and uh, potentially improving access to work. So how could we improve access to work? We have certain public programs, for example, employment guarantee programs in India, which bring work closer to home uh, for women, and we've seen, uh, you know, large participation by women in those uh, publicly provided social protection programs. But there has been very little work on looking at skilling, mobility, and safety as potential policy responses to addressing gender-based inequities that could arise as a result of these shocks. So I think I'm bang on time. Erin should be happy with me. Uh, That's perfect. Thank you, Farzana. <laughs> and a wonderful talk. We have lots of questions coming in. Um, so what I'll do is start with a question that came in the Q&A about the facts that you started with. Um, mm -hmm. Then I noticed as we went along that Michael Tanner had raised his hand and Manali Kasi had dropped some questions in the chat. So I'll, I'll next turn to Michael and Manali and then turn back to the Q&A. So everyone, as you have additional questions, please continue to put them in the Q&A. So Farzana, let me start with the first question from Ravi Agarwal. The agricultural production literature finds that in many African countries, men and women's labor productivity is comparable, but the asymmetric bargaining power in the household leads to less input use on crops being farmed by women as compared to crops farmed by men. So the total productivity for women appears to be lower in the data. Could you comment on the use of complementary inputs um, in farming in the Indian context? Right, so in Africa, I think the structure of uh, agriculture is quite different from what it is in India. And unfortunately, we don't have the kind of disaggregated data that we have in Africa, for example. Uh, so we have data which is at the household level. Uh, so farm ownership at the household level, whereas in, the, in Africa, we have ownership at the individual level. So women might own different pieces of farmland as opposed to men, go, grow different crops. Uh, there is the work uh, which suggests that uh, not only, I, and I'm not sure that it is the case that women are less productive because 
there's work which suggests that because of lower bargaining power of women, there is less allocation of inputs to women's farms as opposed to male farms. So there is you know, rich data suggesting that. Um, unfortunately, we do not have data on productivity per se in India. Uh, and, and in the ICRI-side data actually comes closest to giving us very detailed uh, information at the household level on farm productivity in general, but not individual productivity. So I'm not, uh, I'm not 100%, I'm not, I'm not convinced that women in general have lower productivity, though I do, um, you know, uh, accept the fact that it is possible given that women are also engaged in very peripheral tasks which include weeding for example but they are also engaged in tasks with like harvesting right so for instance one might be very interested in looking at what would happen if there was mechanization in harvesting right and if that is complementary to women's labor what happens to the productivity of women uh, and and is that potentially you know improving um, the labor usage of women for example so uh, that's something that we have not been able to do and it's very demanding in terms of the data that's required uh, but I think, yeah, uh, I mean, in short, the, the context is going to determine the answer to that question. <laughs> Always a good answer. Uh, so now let me turn to Michael Tanner, who had his hand up when you were talking about the first case study. And Michael, I think you should be able to unmute yourself. I think Michael has left. Aha. Thank you, David. <laughs> Um, so, Manali, you had also put some questions in the chat. I thought I would let you pick a question and ask it yourself. So, Manali, I think you can unmute yourself as a panelist. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, th thank you very much. Uh, thanks for uh, the nice presentation. I like it. Just I will have some maybe a comment or a question. The first one is from the, you showed us this, uh, this cute, uh, a farm level division between men and women. So how do you see this from a women empowerment perspective? Is it a bad or a good news? Uh, because of course, India seems a bit different. I hear, for instance, in Kenya have done quite a lot. And in Malawi, we see uh, women contribute more for wedding and tilling. So how do you see that? The other thing is when I see your analysis, you do it technology by technology. Uh, while it seems farm they have adopted a number of technologies. Was it not better to do a linear analysis instead of linear, which, which can give uh, more an important information for policymakers? The other, maybe the last one is, I see on this level using the farm mechanization thing. And then I see a decline in the women participation in agriculture. Mm -hmm. Does this mean women respond to incentives than men? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your first question about whether this is bad or good news, um, I think I was trying to not say, uh, you know, not call it either bad or good news, because uh, it is possible, of course, that the, uh, women might be doing certain, uh, some of these tasks because they are less skilled, let's say, so, uh, uh, so they might be engaged more in weeding. I was just, I, I want to focus, I want to take out the skill aspect or the bad or the good about it, in the sense of, you know, if there are certain biological advantages, um, then men would be, uh, it, they would have comparative advantage and you want to put uh, people in tasks where they are likely to be more productive. Uh, and so if it is the case that that's true, holding everything else constant in terms of women's skill and you know whatever else that might be, uh, you know, it, it is not necessarily a bad or a good, but if I wanted to think of it in terms of skills, then potentially it suggests that it's bad because uh, women might be, you know, being pushed to tasks which are uh, require less skill and maybe less complementary to new technology which is coming in. So, for example, women may not know how to drive tractors, uh, 
uh, they may not know how to operate these uh, machinery and uh, they may not be given the opportunity in terms of the necessary skills which are required in order to be able to do that. So they, they're, they're relegated to certain tasks where, um, which may not you know, enhance their productivity when these technological changes come in. The second question about the linear analysis, when you want to you know, look at all kinds of technological change and, and, and that makes a lot of sense from a policy perspective. But unfortunately with us as academics, it's very, we want to pass out or identify causal effects and that would make it really hard for us to think of you know, what affected what. And that's why we focus on one particular technology, but your point is well taken. Um, and the last question, um, and I forget, I'm so sorry. Uh, can you, it, it's, can it's more of on, on one of your slides on this level is that farm mechanization. We see a decline in women participation in agriculture, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, the question is, does this mean women respond more to incentives than men? Because you mentioned remuneration as well, I think, in, in that slide. Right. So, what do you, so do by incentives, did you mean? Um, I didn't understand exactly what you meant by incentive. What is the yeah, incentive? Maybe it's mind? related to wage or something like that, or maybe they don't oh, like okay. the right, sector. Right, 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 right. So, I think what I was suggesting there was that if the demand for labor falls in, uh, as a result of uh, in that particular activity, then one could move to another occupation or another activity which is non-farm related where you have higher wages uh, or there is demand for your work. And uh, what I was trying to emphasize was that, yes, of course, women would be incentivized by uh, higher wages and higher demand, but because the mobility might be restricted, their access to that kind of work is limited. They're not able to take uh, advantage of those opportunities as much as men might be able to do, particularly when we were thinking in terms of those climatic shocks. I'm gonna slide in one last question here before I let everyone find their next session. Um, and our participants have been using the voting option and they've all upvoted this question. Uh, so this is about the last case you looked at on negative shocks um, and the last graph in that section uh, where it showed that male earnings increase on net following the negative shock. Um, so women's earnings decrease as you might expect after a negative shock, but the results for men seem counterintuitive unless somehow male labor allocation was highly suboptimal to start with. So any explanation? Well, the reason, so I couldn't, I, I couldn't dwell, dwell on on this too much, but the reason why it's happening is that men are moving from the farm sector to the non-farm sector. Uh, and uh, their earnings in the non-farm sector are higher than the earnings in the farm sector. So they might be also moving from the self-employed, from work on own farm to non-farm work, which is not their own, uh, you know, not, not their own enterprise or it's not self-employment. And uh, absolutely, you know, I can see that it is counterintuitive, but it is coming essentially from this migration decision of men. Uh, and uh, there is, an, uh, and of course, I understand from a general equilibrium perspective, if uh, everybody is migrating, then supply is going to go up. And as a result of that, the uh, equilibrium wages should fall. So that's something that one needs to think about a little bit more, but uh, from, you know, from a partial equilibrium or a short term effect, it seems to be the case is that uh, you, a particular village might experience a drought, but maybe the surrounding villages have not. And so it's not affecting the market as a whole. Uh, so it's not depressing wages and you're able to access this higher paid work in the non-farm sector when you move. And, you're, and, and it's not like all the villages are moving at the same time. Different villages are experiencing these shocks at different times. So it's not depressing the equilibrium wage in the, in, in the general equilibrium framework. That's my response to that question. Okay, well, thank you. Um, there are some more questions that have come in that I'll see if we can save and, and send to you afterwards, Farzana, yeah, and maybe you can follow up um, with people who are, <clears throat> have comments and questions. I'll just give the last comment to Thomas Sterner, who said there used to be a division between capital saving technical progress and labor saving technical progress. So maybe we can now complement that with female versus male saving labor. <laughs> 
<laughs> labor saving progress. Okay, well said, well said, Thomas. <laughs> yes, so I, I think all I'm trying to emphasize over here, I think which I made a point at the beginning of the presentation was, uh, we have broad categories of, um, uh, you know, looking at uh, skilled versus unskilled labor, labor saving technological change. Exactly. I mean, the kind of work that, uh, you know, the, the, the technological change that we're thinking of in terms of tractors is labor saving, but whose labor is being saved. Um, uh, and, and then therefore who is benefiting from that? It is men's labor potentially also that is being saved, but because it's complementary to the work, it improves their productivity. It may not reduce their earnings as much as it does for the downstream of a worker, uh, which is very likely to be women. Okay. Well, thank you. And thank you again for your talk. I'm sure yes. if we were in person, you'd be getting a big round of applause now. Uh, so everyone can, can use their little hand clapping signal to let Farzana know how much we appreciated her talk. Thanks everyone for attending this talk and enjoy the rest of today. <laughs>